So far, we've been implementing modules and module types within .ml files. There's another way to do all of this without the module type and module keywords, and that's to factor out the code into two separate files. One of the files is a .mli file. It's the first time we've ever written such a file. The other is a .ml file. So the idea is we put the signature in the .mli file. It's the interface to the module. And we put the implementation in the .ml file. It is the module itself. So here I've put my stack interface into a file named stack.mli. And I have all of the specifications for the names, the types, and the behaviors of each of them. In the .ml file, I put the implementations of all of those. I don't put those specification comments in. We don't repeat them between the two files. That would be redundant. Eventually, they would get out of sync. You wouldn't know which one was right. So we put the public-facing specifications in the .mli file. And then in the .ml file, we put comments that are specifically for those who are going to be implementers or maintainers of the code. So here I've written, stacks are represented by lists. The top of the stack is the head of the list. The bottom of the stack is the last element of the list. That's a comment that people who know that the stack is implemented with the list will need to know about. But for the rest of the world, for the public, they don't need to know that. This factoring of code into two files is known as a compilation unit. A compilation unit is a pair of files with the same base name. One ends with .ml, the other ends with .mli and they're both in the same directory. If the .ml file has some contents, let's call it DM, those are the definitions by the module. And if the MLI file has some contents DS, that's the declarations and the signature, then OCaml essentially behaves as though you had written the following syntax. Module my file, and note that my file is now capitalized. So even though the file name is lowercase, OCaml behaves as, it's, as if it's defining a module here, and module names, of course, must be capitalized. The .mli file becomes the signature that's provided there. However, there's no signature name that's created for this. It's just an anonymous signature. So it's as if you had written colon sig, and then all of the contents of that specification from the MLI file and end in place there. And then follow that with equals struct and then all of the contents from the .ml file. Compilation units are something we'll start using soon enough in our programming assignments, even though we're not quite there yet. They're also used extensively in the standard library. If you're ever curious what the implementation of something looks like in the standard library, it's easy to find. Just Google OCaml GitHub, click on that link that you find there, scroll down to standard lib, and now you will see the .ml and .mli files for all of the modules in the standard library. We've been using list a lot, so let's look at that one. Here's list.mli and list.ml. If you look at the mli file, you will see that it documents, well, specifies the names like the function length, their type, and then it provides a behavioral specification for it in a comment. You can actually provide that specification either on the line before the val declaration or on the line after. Uh, we tend in this class to write it on the line before. The standard library tends to write it on the line after. The implementation of the list module is then provided in list.ml. And you can see here the implementation of the length function. As you'll see, it actually uses a tail recursive helper function that function, length aux, is hidden, never revealed to the outside world. You can't get to it by using list.length aux in Utop because of the compilation unit. Length aux is not mentioned in the interface file, and therefore, because OCaml behaves as though this is the signature for the module, it's not revealed to the outside world, it's encapsulated, nobody can get to it.